He is the epitome of evil. Just as God is what he is, as far as good, uh, Satan is evil. Now, he's not as evil to the degree of, that God is good because no one can reach the degree of what God is in anything. But Satan is so destructive that it is beyond human comprehension. It's beyond us to understand. And so we need to realize, Jesus said, watch ye therefore. For an hour that you think not the Son of Man cometh. Well, what do we watch for? What do we look for? And a lot of times we're so caught up in our own lives and the hustle and bustle of life uh, that we are not really looking and watching, seeing what's going on in the world, um, that the Lord is coming. But that is the reason why we're in the church. That's the reason why we're saved. That's why we got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why we're striving for holiness is because our goal is to get out of here. We are trying to become, or should I say we are trying to be the bride of Christ uh, because the bride of Christ will be those that will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He will look over the church and see all that is, who, that is ready, who has made themselves ready, and then he will say, come up here, and then we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we need to prepare ourselves. We need to be watchful. We need to see what's going on in society. Uh, we need to be attentive. Uh, we need to be sober, vigilant, because our adversary, what? The devil. Can we say amen? And so as we deal with biblical prophecy, biblical prophecy deals with um, the signs of the end times. The theological term for that is called eschatology. If you never heard of eschatology, I think that's E-S-C-H. Uh, e S C H A T O L O G Y E S C H A T O G O Y. Is that right? L Y. <laughs> Thank you. I ain't got it written down here. That's why <laughs> eschatology and eschatology is a theological term by Bible scholars, all it means is the study of the end times because we are in the end times. Now, most biblical prophecy that you see are not spoken of by us apostolics. Most biblical prophecy that you see on television are talked about by those that are non-apostolics. And that is very uh, unfortunate uh, for us because what happens is that because many of our brethren are not talking about it, then we are prone to listen to those on television that talk about it, and they are in error. And so there needs to be an emphasis with us to talk about these things. Now, part of the problem is that many of our brethren don't know eschatology as they ought to. They cannot search it out in the scriptures. They cannot break it down for two reasons. One of them, some of them have been taught, and then others may have been taught, but they haven't applied themselves. And so God has these things in the Bible because he wants us to know. Uh, one minister asked his pastor about some scriptures in the book of Revelation, and he said, don't worry about that. The only people that fool with Revelation are fools and dummies. Well, I don't know what the apostle John was because he wrote it. <laughs> and then, uh, well, that was just a cop-out um, by that pastor because he did not know. And, and, of course, one of the things about uh, our pastors is that if they can't handle certain things, then they, that's what other preachers are for. You get someone in to assist you and help you. Now, Bishop Clifton Jones is the greatest Bible teacher in my mind that's out there. And, of course, I can't teach uh, the way that he teaches, um, so I got him in there to help me and to help the church. And Bishop Paddock used to say that if I have helped the pastor, I have helped the church. And so this is what we do. We're supposed to lean and call on one another, you know, but... Uh, most ministers are called in for the pastor to try to raise some money because, because bills are due. Because they don't know how to teach on tithes, they don't know how to teach on offerings, and so they got to get that money, so they have to get the biggest name preachers that they can get to get, in, to get them in here to try to fleece the people so that they can pay their bills. Well, we don't have that issue here. Is that right? I can get somebody in here to teach on holiness and if you get mad, hold back your money. We still can pay our bills. Uh, 
and then God will have to deal with, with, with an individual. So, um, but it is very unfortunate that we do not have very many people that are focused on eschatology, the end times, the signs of the end times, uh, prophecy, but it's very important. God never would have put it in the Bible if he didn't intend for us to talk about it. Now, as we said before, there are many on television uh, that have a misunderstanding on what biblical prophecy uh, is. Now, some years ago, the largest Jesus Only Oneness organization, the UPC, United Pentecostal Churches, had a convention. And they met and they decided that they were going to allow their ministers and their saints to have televisions. Because for years they taught that having a TV was a sin. And they liked to use the scripture when David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. And so they said the wicked thing is the television and, um, and you're not supposed to do that. Well, David didn't have no LG 55 inch screen back in his days. So he was not talking about television. He's talking about idols, idols. And so they decided, I guess they got the revelation, and they decided that they were going to allow their ministers to have televisions. Well, 1,000 churches left the organization. 1,000 preachers left. Now, they figured to allow them to have television because they wanted to broadcast over television media because they figured that they can reach people because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every creature or preach to all nations. And so there is a man that comes on. I won't call his name since we're streaming. Uh, the name of his program is called The End of the Age. And he is a very good Bible teacher. And uh, most of the information that he teaches on is very accurate. And there are a lot of people that watch him. Now, he's UPC. And so he does a very good job. With one exception, he's got the church going through tribulation period. <laughs> and because that's what the UPC believe. You see, um, the UPC reject the teachings of Bishop Haywood. And Bishop Haywood gave us the foundation of all of the knowledge that we have of God today. And so they don't, they don't accept his teaching because he was a black man for the most part. They still honor him in some of their historical books. Now I have the history of the UPC in my office right now. And it mentions Bishop Haywood and it gives some acolytes to him. But then it says, but though he was a Negro, I have that in my library right now. And so because they did not receive a lot of the teachings of Bishop Haywood, they have gone off into error thinking that the church is going through part of the tribulation period or all of the tribulation period. Now, um, that is not true because the Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of what? The coming of the Son of Man. Now, Noah, if you didn't know, went into that ark seven days before the flood came. He was in the ark safe seven days before the judgment of God fell on the earth. That typified that the church will be rescued before the seven year tribulation period. And uh, of course he said as it was in the days of Lot. Just as Lot escaped the judgment of God on Sodom and Gomorrah. So shall the church of God escape. As it was in the days of Lot. So shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man. Now most of the confusion comes out of the 24th chapter of Matthew. And out of the book of Daniel. And out of the book of Revelation. And, of course, I hear a lot of preachers use the scripture in Revelation that um, they overcome by uh, the word of their testimony. You know that scripture? How's that scripture go? They overcame by what? Overcame by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their what? That's not the church. That's the tribulation saints. <laughs> We already overcame because we are already up in heaven with the, with, the, with the rapture. But you see, you have saints, the word saints mentioned during the tribulation period in the book of Daniel. Uh, that it says that the Antichrist will make war with the saints. That's the tribulation saints. That has to do with those uh, uh, that will be saved during the tribulation. And they will not be getting baptized in Jesus' name. They will not be getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Their salvation is that they have to give their lives. And so you have a lot of mis, 
misinterpretation, misunderstanding of the scriptures. And so, like I said to today, Bible class today, the word of God is like a puzzle. When you look in there, as we said before, um, you go to the store and buy a puzzle. And of course, you look on the top of that puzzle, you have the picture that's on, uh, that the puzzle is supposed to look like. But when you open it up, does it look like that? No, is you have a bunch of pieces. And so you have to dump the whole thing on the table and each piece goes together, but you have to find where it fits. And once you find each piece of puzzle that fits in its proper place, and it takes a, lot, a little bit of time, uh, you, once you get all the pieces together, then you have the pieces of the puzzle together and what you have on the table looks just like what's on top of the box. Well, there are 37,173 pieces of scripture in the Bible. And each of those scriptures fit a certain part. And you have to get those verses together, all those pieces together, and find out where they fit. And if they fit in, a, in their proper place, then you will have the understand, understanding that God intended for you to have. See, the Bible's written in subjects. And that's why people read it and they don't understand it because it's written in subjects. You can have five or ten subjects in a verse. And so if you're going to study, for example, baptism, then you have to go through all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and get all of the pieces of the puzzle that deal with baptism. And then once you have all of the pieces of the puzzle together, then you have to go through each one of those scriptures, paying close attention to all kinds of things and seeing where they fit. And when you got all of those pieces of the puzzle, all of those scriptures fitting in their proper place, dealing with baptism, then you will have what God meant by what is baptism? How is it to be administered? What is the formula? And so on and so forth. That's how the Bible's written. Now, you don't necessarily have to do that because you have a pastor to do it for you. <laughs> Can we say amen? pastor sits up late at night or gets up early in the morning or studies during the day and then he gets everything all those hundreds of pieces together I remember one time I was studying the subject the heart and I remember there was over 800 scriptures in the Bible on the heart and then once you run reference on the heart then you find out that the mind is part of the heart so then you have to look up the scriptures that deal with the mind and and so on and so forth and so you can't do it in five minutes it takes a long time and so we go through that hours at a time using biblical su supplements, using uh, uh, looking up definitions and dictionaries, looking up the manners and customs of the people in that day, uh, looking at the person speaking, who is he speaking to, why is he speaking, what he's speaking, the place where he's speaking at, the verbs, the tenses of the verbs, the adjectives, the pronouns, the prepositional phrases, the commas, the semicolons, the colons, and all other kind of stuff, the, comp the capitalizations, the tenses of the verbs, and all that. And we do all that and come in and then get ready to teach, and folk don't come to church because they say they were tired. <laughs> After we do all that work. <laughs> so we have to ask the Lord to help us. Can we say amen? <laughs> All right, so, um, but you don't necessarily have to do that because it's all done for you. And all you have to do is come to Bible class, hear the word of the Lord, let God write it in your heart, uh, take good notes, get the CD, go back home and go over and meditate it, and God builds you up that way. All right, so um, that man that teaches into the age has a good broadcast, but he's not as accurate as he needs to be. Because the church is not going through tribulation. The Bible says we shall be saved from wrath through him. And so this is what we want to talk about. We want to talk about biblical prophecy showing you in the Bible the things that are to come. Showing you why the things are happening that are happening. They're just not by accident and all these type of things. Now the Bible did speak in prophecy concerning the rise of, of, of homosexuality and all these kinds of things. Now I saw an article today that I sent it to a few people. And in the article, it stated that people that have sex reassignment surgery become depressed, suicidal, dissatisfied, and they want to go back. <laughs> they want to. And of course, those surgeries can cost anywhere from 15000 to 100000 and so they look up in that, look at themselves. They're not satisfied uh, what God made them to be. And so they uh, get tricked by the enemy. And they go in and they have these sex reassignment surgeries. And then they look at themselves and they probably get terrified. 
and say, oh, God, what I did, what did I do? Now, I remember, and I'm going to tell you this story, uh, being terrified. I remember when I was with uh, the True Churches of Apostolic Faith. Elder Herman Cross was my pastor at the time. He tarried with me to get the Holy Ghost, 15 years old. We were out passing out tracts. And we went over on Francis Street, which is like the ghetto. And then, of course, we went and knocked on this door. And a woman came to the door. And he looked at me and looked at her. I looked at him and looked at her. And she looked at me, and I looked at her, and it was me as a woman. Because the woman looked just like me. And when I saw her, I said, I make an ugly looking woman. <laughs> and I had more hair than she had. <laughs> and, and the pastor said, you two must be related. And so I said, who's your father? Floyd Johnson. I said, Lord, have mercy. That's how I met my sister, Phyllis. <laughs> and I went and told him, <laughs> that was the ugliest version of a woman of me I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> and all kind of stuff happened to me. <laughs> so I went and said, Floyd. I said, I thought you was just me. I thought it was just me and Ricky. Who's this Phyllis woman? He said, well, boy, you know, I got involved with this girl when I was 14, and she said she got pregnant. She was 19, and, and my mother told me, uh, that ain't your child. You too young to do anything. I said, mama, grandmama lied to you. I said, man, because that girl looked just like me and you. I said, I didn't realize I was so ugly looking at her. And she looked like, I said, Lord, have mercy. Well, that's how I found out about my sister Phyllis. And of course, my father died in 1998, and six months later, she died. So she is uh, deceased, but, you know, she looked so bad because she was an alcoholic uh, and all that. So, but that's how, that's, <laughs> that's how I met my sister. So when I see the article about these transgender people, I can imagine to some degree what they're going through. Because they're looking at themselves now is that that's how it looked like if I was a woman? No, you wouldn't look like that. But you just got messed up. That's all. Just goes to show you now it's really something because the devil tricks them into doing it. And then they're too poor to go back. <laughs> I was talking to one of my preacher friends today. And because uh, I sent him the article, he said, well, what are you going to do with one of them coming to your church? I said, um, well... I'm going to treat them just like anybody else. He said, what if they want to go to the bathroom? I say, they have to go at home. <laughs> now, <laughs> just pray for me. Hallelujah. Because if they looking like a woman and voice is deeper than Brother Charles, then we got a problem. <laughs> he would say, amen. <laughs> I'm just going to have to hold everybody here in the church. Say, okay, now you can go. Use the restroom. Which one? Whatever one you want to use. Just hurry up and get out of there and get back in here. Lord, I hope we don't have that problem. I think that would be an issue for me to turn over to the deacons. Wouldn't that be something? Have the deacons handle it. <laughs> All right. Well, how do we get off into that? Lord, have mercy. <laughs> well, that's, the Bible deals with all that. It tells us how bad things are going to be. And this is what we're dealing with. Now, um, one thing about biblical prophecy, and I have to tell you all these things before we get started, um, is that there's two words that sound the same. They're almost spelled the same with the exception of one letter. That is prophesy and prophecy. Prophesy is P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y, which means to preach, to expound from God's word. Prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, which means to foretell the future. Words are spelled the same with the exception of one letter, S-Y, excuse me, C-Y, prophesy, prophecy. Prophecy has to do with foretelling the future. Now, the one that does the most prophesying or prop, uh, the one that does the most in prophecy is the pastor. Because one of the 18 titles of the pastor is that he is the New Testament prophet. And God generally gives him or her 
uh, a word of prophecy at times, uh, and they prophesy. Now, um, I have prophesied a few times in my saved life, and I'm saying foretelling the future. And of course, when we were in Michigan, um, I made the statement, this church has never had a death of a member of this church. I said, but it is coming. And of course, the last time I had said it was I was teaching on the gifts of the spirit, and I said it again. I said, this church has never had a death, but one day it's coming. I didn't know that three weeks later it was going to be our own son. And so sometimes God will give the pastor something in, to prophesy or in prophecy to prepare him and to prepare the church. And when our son passed away, uh, it changed the complexion of our church when that happened. He was died in Christ, died saved at the young age of 18 years of age. And so sometimes the pastor will prophesy. Now, there are those that expect to come to church and something miraculous is supposed to happen at the church every time they come. You know, they say, well, Jesus said, well, they like to say something's wrong with the church because the miracles are not being performed. Jesus said, greater work shall ye do uh, because I go unto my Father. And so they say, we're not seeing the greater works. Well, you have to understand what are the greater works. There's more people being saved. Because when Jesus was here, nobody got saved. Well, he imputed salvation to the thief on the cross, but uh, Jesus died before he did. So um, the greatest miracle today is people getting saved, being brought out of darkness into his marvelous what? Like those are the greater works because when Jesus was here, no one was filled with the Holy Ghost. But today people are being filled with the Holy Ghost out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. All right, so those are the greater works. Now they say, well, we want to see miracles, signs, and wonders, and all of that, and they expect to see it when they come to church every time. Well, as we told them in day Bible class, in the book of Acts, it covers the first 30 years of the New Testament church. 28 chapters it covers the first 30 years. In that 30 years in the book of Acts, there are only 13 miraculous happenings in that book. 13 miraculous happenings over a 30-year period, and people expect to see something every time they come to church? That would put us so much higher than the apostles, is that right? And this is the era of the apostles. And so um, the greatest miracle today is people being saved, being brought out of the dope houses, off of the street corners, putting down the liquor bottle, giving up drugs, and following Jesus. That's the greatest miracle because no one was doing that when the Lord was here on the earth. That was not his job at the time. He came to die for the sins of the world. And so we are doing the greater works. And of course, God is working miracles throughout the earth. And of course, miracles today are not for the same reason as they were in the apostles' day, but that's another subject. Maybe we'll get back to that. Um, but we should realize then that um, God is still working in his church. And as long as people are getting saved, that is the greater works that we are doing, that the church is doing. He said the church would do greater works than he did when he was here because he is working through the church to save souls. Can we say amen? All right, so um, the pastor, the New Testament pastor, is the prophet of the church. And we prophet and we give prophecy all the time. Um, Jesus is coming. That's a what? That's a prophecy. Can we say amen? The wrath of God has fallen on the earth. That's a what? Prophecy because it hasn't happened yet. And so you have individuals that like to walk around, call themselves prophets, and they like to come in church and, and, and point out somebody and say, God said your check is in the mail. And then the next day you get a bill in the mail. <laughs> well, you know God didn't say that. Is that right? Well, maybe he said it to another person, not just to me. Well, I don't know about that. Um, but, you know, we just need to stick with what the Bible says. You know, uh, God said, now I remember I was in one service and uh, uh, the preacher got up there and said, God, and we was at tent revival outside. And he said, everybody run around outside the tent. God said, run around the tent. And I saw mothers trying to run around, and I was just stood there. Look, I've never been the type of person to just do what everybody tells me to do. I just stand there and look around. <laughs> and 
Now, they would run, and then they would stop. I didn't tell you to stop. Keep running. So I guess they all start running. I said, here we go. Exercise class. That's what it's doing. Cardio. Getting your cardio in had nothing to do with Jesus. So he was looking at me, and I was looking at him. And I was, he, was looking, he was looking at me like, how come you ain't running? I'm looking at you saying, how come you ain't running? <laughs> I'm a mess, am I? I? I'm just telling you. You know, there's a lot of foolishness that go on in the pulpit. You know, trying to manip, manip, manipulate people. Can we say amen? And somebody told me they had a preacher here uh, years ago that the church gave her $40,000 offering. I said, she may be glad I wasn't a pastor. <laughs> She wouldn't have got no $40,000 from me. That would have went in the church. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes you can give folk too much. Too much of anything is not good. Is that right? Well, we raised a lot of money. Well, I would think that God wants the church to have the money. First, ain't no 60-40 split. <laughs> can we say amen? You get what we feel you should have. Now, I know the labor is worthy of his hire. That's good. But, you know, just as we tell you to trust God in giving, then we tell the preacher, trust God in receiving. Can we say amen? Why am I supposed to trust God in giving and you ain't supposed to trust God to receive? <laughs> I could say some more. I bet not. But <laughs> praise the Lord. So, prophecy. Prophesying. Now, um, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's all about money today, isn't it? Now, there's nothing wrong with blessing people with money. But when you walk around with a sense of entitlement to it, oh, I think I should get more than this. Okay, well, let me have that check back. We'll take care of it. They do it to me. I'm going to give them another check. It's going to be half what they got the first time. I think you made a mistake. No, 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 no. This is, this is, uh, this is right. You're right. We gave you too much the first time. <laughs> you can't do that. Is that right? Well, that ain't right, Pastor. Well, pray for me. Or better yet, give them your check. Can we say amen? <laughs> All right. Second Timothy chapter. Well, this is going out on the stream. When we get folk now, they ain't going to mess with us about money, are they? <laughs> it's out there on Facebook and on the stream. <laughs> All right. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Let's read. All right. I still hear some pages turning. All right. So we'll wait a minute. All right. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved. What are we supposed to do to be approved under God? Study. We need to study. I've had preachers say to me, I haven't studied. I haven't looked at anything. I'm just going to open my mouth and let God fill it. Well, the Bible says, study to show thyself what? Approved unto God. I knew one brother that um, had a revival. They had him in a five-day revival. And uh, he fell out the second day. He didn't have no more information to give him. So his wife was a minister. She had to finish it out. She can only go two days. Because sitting up there saying, I'm not going to look at nothing. I'm just going to trust God. You ain't trust God. You're just being lazy. Study to show thyself what? Approved unto God. Approved unto God. Now, if you study properly and get up to teach and preach, people will know that you know what you're talking about. Is that right? I've had some people say that they were going to come to church and shut me up. Come to, <laughs> come to church and, 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 and uh, show me that I'm wrong. And I remember there was one sister that was talking to this one unsaved guy, and he was trying to tell her that what I was saying was not right. And uh, she said, well, why don't you come and ask some questions? Oh, you don't want me to come. If I come there, I'm going to turn the whole church over. I said, bring him. Tell Abdullah to come on over here. And so Abdullah came and sat out in the, uh, in the audience, and uh, I was teaching. And so then when I got done, I said, are there any questions? 
Abdullah put his head down. I think he was praying to Allah at that time. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. And so then I went to him. I said, I heard you ask some questions. Well, uh, no, no, uh, uh, you cleared everything up for me. I said, good. You know. Now, I don't know everything, but what I know, I know. And it's like Bishop uh, Carl F. Smith said, and I took this to heart. He said, when a teacher or a preacher is teaching and they are not completely uh, study their subject, they are undone as a teacher. And so I may not know everything, but what I'm talking about, I know it backwards and forwards and upside down, and uh, that takes a lot of time to do that. Can we say amen? Because you don't know what questions are coming, but if you have properly studied your subject, you'll be able to answer all those questions. And there might be some questions we can't answer, but we say we'll get back with you because I want to know the answer to that question too. Is that right? So we need to study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, most ministers don't have good study habits because they didn't develop them di during their formative years. Now, I don't like to read. Uh, I get a newspaper. I just breeze through it. Get a magazine. I just look at the pictures. <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I do, you know. But if it's something relative to the Bible, I'm going to read that because I'm not, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to read it, you know, because I'm like, okay, uh, this is relative to the scriptures. I can use this or I can see that or God may open my understanding about certain things. Now, I've read the Quran. I've read Jehovah Witness Bible. I've read the Catholic Bible. I've read, um, um, what did I say? The Book of Mormon. I've read all those things. And so when I talk with them, I know what I'm talking about because I've read their material. The, um, they have the book Quran, used to be the big green book. Now they got the Sunny Muslim book that I've read that. I've read the Gospel according to Enoch, the Gospel of Egypt, the Lost Books of Eden, the Lost Books of the Bible. I've read all that stuff. So I can tell you, you don't need any of that stuff. You just need the 66 books. I've read the Seven Day Adventist books. Uh, the watchtowers that they have. Is that the Seventh-day Adventist watchtower? Is that Jehovah Witness? That's Jehovah Witness. Uh, Charles Taz Russell and, and the Russellites and Judge Rutherford, who were the uh, founders of the Jehovah Witness, and Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormonism, and all that other kind of stuff. Read all that stuff because uh, it's relative to the Bible. And you have to know um, what those folk are talking about in order to be able to deal with it. Now, you see these word of faith churches. Word of faith churches have their own doctrine. And I think I got about a 300 page, uh, 300 pages of the word of faith doctrine that was um, done by um, John Hagee. No, John Hagee's the one that's preaching now, is he? Kenneth Hagen. Kenneth Hagen. And you will find that if you um, fully study their doctrine, you will find that many of the evangelical Pentecostal fundamentalists, somebody said, what in the world is that? That sounded pretty good, didn't it? Evangelical Pentecostal fundamentalists, who are they? These are the Joyce Myers, the Fred Price. Of course, I think he took his church back because his son stepped down. I think he had an alcohol problem or something. So he took over the church. You know, he was the apostle of the church. And then you have um, uh, Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> You know, the I have sin guy and all that kind of stuff. Jimmy Swagger and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Osteen. All these individuals studied the word of faith doctrine under Kenneth Hagin. And that's why they all say the same thing. Creflo Dollar, the dollar man, Creflo Dollar. A lot of those guys study those doctrines. And it's very unfortunate because you get some of our brethren, they won't get books of the fathers. They'll go get the books by those individuals because they think that their church can be like their church. God's church can never be like the world church. Can we say amen? He's going to see to it. It's not going to work right because uh, those churches are not God's churches. So uh, the thing of it is, is that um, we have to stick with our own doctrine. Now, you never see the Catholics teaching apostolic doctrine in their schools, do you? 
You don't see the Catholics talking about repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. They're too busy talking to Mary. Like one woman said, now, 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 if you want God to do for you, if you want Jesus to answer your prayer, you talk to Jesus' mother, Mary, because he has to do what mommy says do. Well, mommy is dead. Can we say amen? And Jesus is on the throne. But that's what, they, that's what they believe. That's what they teach. And so why is it then that if these other denominations don't compromise their doctrine, why do we compromise ours? It's because we look and see what they got, and we want what they got. Just like Israel said, we want a king like all the other nations. <laughs> like all the other nations. All right, well, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth what? Not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a right division to the scriptures. And the Bible is not truth in and of itself, only when it is rightly divided. What does rightly divided mean? Taking the pieces of the puzzle and putting them in their proper places. And when you do that, then you have truth. When you misapply them, put them in the wrong places, you don't have truth, you have error. You have error. And there's a lot of error that goes on out there because they are not putting the pieces of the puzzle in their proper places. And so biblical prophecy is very difficult with a lot of ministers because they are putting the wrong pieces in their places. You follow what we're saying? You know, and of course, uh, we want to show you um, uh, what the truth is now. Remember the guy that did Azusa Street, the Azusa conferences. Remember him? Remember that guy? The Azusa guy? I ain't going to call his name because I've already called names enough. Well, Paul called names five times. Am I up to five? No. Carlton Pearson. That's number five there. Remember Carlton Pearson? Well, the, he was a uh, evangelical Pentecostal fundalist. And the reason why they call themselves Pentecostals is because they speak in tongues. Pentecostal is speaking in tongues. But they're Trinitarians. That's what evangelical uh, fundamentalists come in. So they're Trinitarian tongue speakers. Now, Carlton Pearson, I watched the article, I watched his interview one time, because the evangelical Pentecostal fundamentalist believes that unless you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you will die and go to hell. Everybody has to accept them as their personal savior or they're going to be lost, even children, even babies. This is what they teach, that if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you're going to be lost. Now, everybody's not going to know Jesus as their personal savior. Everybody's not going to know about Jesus because you have some parts in the world, like in the rainforest, they don't know nothing about Jesus out there. Well, I thought the Bible says everybody's going to know the truth. Not in this dispensation is not. The scripture says, uh, actually it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to every nation, then shall the end come. What is he saying? There will be a witness of someone being saved out of every nation, and that has happened already. There are people saved out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people right now. So that you know then the rapture is going to take place. That's not the same as everybody knowing about salvation because you got new babies being born every day. What do they know? So it does not mean that every single person will know that they have to be baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost. If that was the case then, then um, who was going to be saved in the tribulation period if they all rejected the truth in this day? Because Jesus said, he that believeth not shall be what? Y'all read that? It's in the Bible. Shall be what? Damned. You say amen? So, but that's what they believe. So Carlton Pearson was watching television and he was looking at these Africans and how they were starving to death and having a hard time and, you know, difficulty and all that. And he said, Lord, I can't believe that all these people are going to hell because they have not accepted you as a personal savior. And he said, God said, they're not going to hell. There is no hell. Hell is what you make of it on the earth. And he said that God said that to him and said, oh, no, there's no such thing as hell. That is something that came up during the medieval ages. Um, I died for the sins of the world. So since I died for the sins of the world, 
everybody in the world is saved. And so he went to his church, 5,000 members, and told him he got a revelation. Now, he didn't get a revelation. He got a revolution. <laughs> or as one, my pastor used to say, he got a devilation, because that wasn't no revelation. And they threw him out. And so some of his contemporaries said, well, if there's no heaven and no hell, then why is he preaching? What sense does it make him being a preacher if there's no heaven or hell? And then, of course, the last I've heard of him, he went and joined a gay church down in California somewhere. Still preaching and all that. But that's what they believe, many of those evangelical fundamentalists. And so that's why they get on television and they say, repeat after me and uh, say the sinner's prayer. And then now you're born again, find a Bible-believing church. Now, I don't know no church that ain't no Bible-believing church. Every church say that they believe in the Bible. Is that right? <laughs> so... Uh, but but that's what they that's what they teach. Now, first of all, that's not true. Um, everybody uh, that is baptized is not you know the old timers used to say it's holiness or hell. Is that right? You ever heard of that? That's not true. It's not holiness or hell. It's only holiness of hell to those that know that they're supposed to live holy. Those that don't know, how can it be holiness or hell with them? And in the tribulation period. You're going to have the two witnesses that's going to be preaching. Moses and Elijah in 11 chapter Revelation. And they're going to be preaching to the world, don't take the mark of the beast. And when those people refuse to take the mark, they will be killed. And your Bible says they will be caught up to heaven. Those are the virgins, her companions that follow her, the church, part of the wedding party. So everybody is not going to be baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost, and everybody is not going to be lost that's not baptized in Jesus' name filled with the Holy Ghost because everybody's not going to know. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That cannot apply to anybody that has never heard because how can they hear except they hear a preacher, and how can he preach except he would be what? Sent. That statement applies to all of us that are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost that know about holiness. With us, it's holiness or what? Hell. But that does not apply to those that don't know the truth. Jesus said, if I had not spoken to them, then they would not have sinned. What does that mean? Is that if they didn't know what my expectations were, I can't hold them accountable to what they don't know. But then he says, now they have no cloak for their sin. In other words, if I have exposed you to the truth and you, direct, and you rejected it, then you're going to be lost. You're going to be held accountable to what you know. But if you don't know about the truth, how can God hold you accountable to that which you knew nothing about? Now, a lot of times we witness the folk and we say, oh, I know they know it. How do you really know? Only God knows. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God does what? looks on the heart. So it's holiness or hell to those of us that know about holiness. To those that don't know, God's going to judge them. How? I was hungry and you gave me meat. Oh, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Oh, I was thirsty and you did not help me. They're going to be judged based upon the level of right and wrong that they knew as to how they treated their fellow man. That's when he sets the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left, and we're going to get to that because our focus of our lesson is going to be the 24th and the 25th chapter of Matthew because they both go together. Can we say amen? All right, so this is how all of these misunderstandings, false teachers come because they take the pieces of the Bible, the scriptures, and they put them in the wrong spaces, wrong places. They don't fit. They try to make them fit, and they come up with something that God never intended for them to uh, make it say what God never intended for it to say. You see, a lot of ministers today, they teach what they believe God meant by what he said. And that's not how to do it. I'm not to teach you what I believe what God meant by what he said. I'm to tell you what he meant by what he said. But I can't do that if I don't study to show myself to prove unto God. I can't do that if I haven't been taught. I can't do that if I don't apply myself. And then if I can't do it, how can I pass it on to you? And therefore you will suffer because you won't know what's right and what's wrong. And then you turn on the television and look at the preachers on there that are talking about 
trying to talk about deep things where well, all we're talking about is blessings, and then you get misguided. And you'd be sitting around saying, I wonder is the Antichrist going to come? I bet not take the mark of the beast. And there goes the rapture. Where are them folk going? <laughs> it really ain't funny, is it? <laughs> it's going to happen to a lot of people. A lot of people. All right. Now, um, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And of course, um, he was listening to that false spirit that talked to him. Oh, the devil will talk to you. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Especially if you listen to him. I ain't got nobody to talk to. Won't nobody talk to me. Just hold on. <laughs> you better talk to Jesus. Is that right? <laughs> now, they say that the Bible is a book of man's opinions, that men wrote the Bible. And it is nothing more than man's opinions and man's interpretations of what God meant. The Bible is nothing like that. All right? So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 16. All right? Let's read. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his what? Majesty. Now notice he says, for we, we, the pronoun we, who is he referencing to? Well, first of all, who's writing this? I can hear you. Who is it, John? Peter. What book are we writing in? Book of Peter, is that right? You gotta be afraid to answer. Stand on the truth. Can we say amen? I know it's John writing this. I don't care what they said. <laughs> Peter, is that right? Now, you notice the pronoun we, for we, we. Who is he talking about? Himself and the rest of the apostles. We, the pronoun we. He didn't say, for I have. He said, for what? We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were eyewitnesses. We're not telling you some made-up story. We are eyewitnesses. We saw him heal the sick. We saw him raise the dead. We saw him open the eyes of the blind. We saw him cast out devils. We saw him feed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread and turn around and fed another 4,000. We saw him walking on the Sea of Tiberias. We saw him crucified and die on the cross. We saw him raised from the dead. We were eyewitnesses of his what? Majesty. If anybody knew the truth, the apostles knew. Can we say amen? And one of the characteristics of the apostles is that they were all taught by Jesus. Now, what apostle today is being taught by Jesus? Half of them won't even read the Bible. <laughs> they look in the dictionary and see where apostle means messenger. Oh, I'm a messenger. So is the mailman. But he ain't no apostle, is he? <laughs> Because he brings you mail that you don't want and some mail that you do want. So um, they think that an apostle is a messenger because that's what it says in the dictionary. And that's not true. Apostles more than that. So um, they, we don't have anybody taught by Jesus personally today, right? Anybody know anybody that Jesus came down and personally taught them for three years like he did the rest of the apostles? No. So how are they apostles? They're not. Paul said, I'm an apostle, apostle of Jesus Christ according to the will of God. We have some folk calling themselves apostles that is not according to the will of God, it's according to their will. Because they want to appear to be more than what they really are. And now, are they sinning? No, they just have a misunderstanding. <laughs> They're not apostles. You have some folk walking around, I am prophetess so-and-so. I am prophet so-and-so. 
Now, anybody ever asks you that, ask them, what does that mean? And watch them struggle. The first sign that they struggle, when you say, what does that mean? They say, what does it mean? See, when they say that, they're trying to get, they're trying to get it going. <laughs> Are you a, a prophet like the Old Testament prophets? Well, yeah. Well, Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John, that John is the last Old Testament prophet. Well, well I'm, I'm a New Testament prophet. How was that? <laughs> I had one person tell me one time, I'm a seer. I said, you're a what? <laughs> I almost said, well, I'm an overseer. <laughs> oh, why can't we just be what we're supposed to be? <laughs> we say, man, if you're a man, be a man. If you're a woman, be a woman. Don't go out and try to be a um, roach. I don't know. People always want to be something that they ain't got no business being. <laughs> is that right? I mean, you know, the highest office in the church is pastor. Pastor. Now, of course, organizationally, it's, we have, you know, a bishop and suffolk bishops and presider. But when it's all said and done, the highest office in the church is pastor. That's really basically the highest office in the church. Can we say amen? You know, so, but people want to be original or nothing, and they wind up being both. And uh, that's very unfortunate. You know, if you notice the apostles, if you read the book of Acts and read the epistles, the apostles addressed each other by their first name. You bet not do that today. You better call me bishop. Elder, let me tell you something. I'm bishop. <laughs> let me tell you something. I'm elder. Don't you call me no minister. I'm elder. Elder. E L D R. Elder. <laughs> we all caught up in these titles, aren't we? God ain't going to have no seat over here. Okay, Jesus ain't going to be in heaven. Okay, all the bishops over here, all the elders over here, where are the apostles at? Here we are, all right, behind me. It's not going to happen. When the apostles addressed themselves, they addressed themselves by their, Peter said, our own beloved brother, Paul. Is that right? Paul said, Cephas. Why are we so title driven? We just want to be bishop. Peter, you're making, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh. I bet not say P.A.W. making bishops with no members. I bet not say that. That's what they're doing. I mean, you know. I know one person that's a bishop. She got five members. Lord have mercy. Let's move on here. Verse number 17. For he received from God the Father, that's Jesus, honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the what? Excellent glory. This is my what? Love son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven. What? We heard when we were with him in the what? That's the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there. So in other words, he is saying, look, what are we talking about? We know what we're talking about. We were there. We were there. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Let's read on. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. We have a sure word of prophecy. What we're talking about is sure, it's true, it's steadfast. Because we are writing what we saw. And it is sure. Let's read. Whereunto ye do well, that ye do what? If you take heed to what the apostles have taught, how are you going to do? Well. Is that right? The apostles' doctrine. Can we say amen? All right, let's read. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. That's the rapture he's talking about. So you will do well until the rapture takes place because you will be in the rapture because you followed us that were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now they're not here today, but they handed their truth down to their disciples. Who handed their truth, who handed that same truth down to their disciples, and so on and so forth. 
And so you had Bishop Haywood, who was the greatest out of all of the preachers in the Latter Rain Church, who handed it down to Bishop Paddock and Bishop Golder. Bishop Golder and Bishop Paddock, uh, I think Bishop Golder got saved in 1929. Bishop Paddock got saved in 1928. So they were of the second generation. All right? And then you have Bishop Schultz, who was Bishop Schultz and Bishop Douglas, who was Bishop Schultz and Bishop Douglas were of that first generation. They were the fathers that handed it down to their children. All the way down to my time, I think I'm the fifth or sixth generation, and I'm handing it down to you. The same thing that they taught. Can we say amen? Nothing new, nothing made up. I wouldn't hide in the dark in the closet somewhere and came out and said, I got something to give you. <laughs> Anything like that. Teaching the same thing that they taught. Because if it was enough to get them into Christ, then it's enough to help us make it. Is that right? See, they gave us so much stuff. We don't have to try to figure out our own stuff. What I'm teaching you is what I've been taught by the fathers. I don't have to make up my own stuff. I don't have to go to no commentary and get stuff out. I don't need Spurgeon's notes of sermons. I don't need John Calvin's writings. I don't need Matthew Henry's commentary or Baker's commentary or Adam Clark's commentary. I'll just give you what they gave me. And it's a lot. Can we say amen? All right. So um, let's read on. Verse 20. Knowing this first that what? No prophecy of the scripture is of any what? Now that's what, see why, is that right? No prophecy of the scripture is of any what? Private interpretation. This is not our private interpretation. We were eyewitnesses of what he did. And what he did was spoken of in prophecy in the Old Testament time. And we saw it. And we're telling you about it. Let's read. Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Now he says old time. What time is he talking about? The past. That's right. The prophecy came not in old time. Old Testament. Old Testament. You see, they preached and taught from the Old Testament scriptures. Because they were writing the New Testament. When the apostles preached and taught, they taught using the Old Testament scriptures. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he took his text from the 16th Psalm. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see what? Corruption. They preached and taught from the Old Testament. And then to help the local churches, they wrote epistles based on the revelation that they received from the Old Testament as to how the New Testament was to operate, called the New Testament commandments. And everything that we do in the New Testament church, the pattern is in the Old Testament. The pattern is in the Old Testament. Can we say amen? <laughs> now, um, the reason why we don't allow unsaved people to function in the church, to do things in the church, is because that violates the Old Testament pattern. Now, many ministers are doing it because they want their churches to grow. I am a firm believer, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain. They what? Build it. Now, you think about it like this. In the Old Testament, under Moses, there was a tabernacle. Is that right? And the tribe that was responsible for everything that dealt with the tabernacle was the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, the Levites. No one was, do any, was to do anything with that tabernacle. They were not even to look inside and look at those pieces of furniture. They were not to touch any of those pieces of furniture. God will kill them dead. The Levites had the charge of the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle was a type of the church. Israel was a type of the world. The Levites were a type of the saints of God because the Levites were the priesthood. Remember the scripture says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood. So you didn't have Moses having the tribe of Reuben doing anything with the tabernacle. Because God told him, you do everything according to the pattern that I showed you because what I'm telling you to do is going to be a reflection of what's going to happen in the New Testament. So that's why you don't do that. 
You didn't see Moses going to the Hittites and say, come on over to our sacrifices. Come on over and celebrate our feast with us. Because they were a type of the world. He didn't mix Israel with the world. Now, if the other nations wanted to be part of the children of Israel, they had to be circumcised and be proselyted to the Jewish faith and keep the commandments. And these are those in the scriptures in the Old Testament that were called the strangers. Because they were not born Israelites, they were proselyted to the, Is to the Jewish faith. How is that similar today? We bring them out of the world, they come in here and get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with what? The Holy Ghost. But we don't call them strangers, they are the children of God. So everything that is in the Old Testament pattern, we're supposed to follow in the New Testament. But when you don't follow it, then you have problems in the church because you're not following the pattern. The problem is a lot of times they don't know the pattern. <laughs> they don't know the pattern. And if they don't know the pattern, how can they follow the pattern? See, there's a difference between know what, what you're supposed to do versus why are you supposed to do it? See, a lot of ministers don't know the why. And that's just important as you know knowing what to do. God don't, doesn't just tell us what to do. He tells us why we need to do it. So any minister can get up here and can tell you what to do, but why I got to do that? Why can't I smoke cigarettes? Cigarettes ain't in the Bible. God made the herb. He said the herb. <laughs> See, you don't even why can't I smoke it? <laughs> well, I've heard people say that. Have you heard people say that? Bible don't say nothing about a woman can't lie with a woman, so why can't I? It says a man should not lie with a man. A woman should not lie down to a beast. But there's no scripture that says a woman can't lie with a woman. We have to know the what? The why. Can we say amen? The why. And a lot of times people don't know the why. So we got to tell you what God said and why God said not to do certain things. Can we say amen? <laughs> now, of course, that's not how our parents did us. Mama said, don't do that. Why? <laughs> I think I heard my mother say, because I said so more than I heard my name. Well, I just want to know. And then she gave you that look. <laughs> Is that right? And when my mother was fed up, she said, you better go on somewhere. <laughs> And I was gone somewhere. And my brother Ricky said, what's wrong with, what's wrong with mama? Go and ask her. <laughs> and I'm standing back seeing what's going to happen. <laughs> we have to know the why. Is that right? Well, we're almost finished. Let's finish up this verse. Well, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Let's read. But holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy. That's how we got the old time prophecy. Holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Ghost. And they wrote as they were moved by what? The Holy Ghost. Now somebody said that's Old Testament. Where's the New Testament? Well, the scripture says all scripture is given by what? Is that right? Where's that at? I don't have that written down here. All scripture is given by the what? Inspiration of God. Is that 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy what? Yes, 2 Timothy 3, 16. Well, that's Old Testament because it said old time. Okay, well, we'll fix you up. We'll give you some New Testament. This will be our last scripture. All right, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. What is the purpose of the scriptures? Well, we're going to look at it. Verse 16. <laughs> All right. Let's read. All what? Scripture is given by the what? That word inspiration of God means God breathed. It came from his mouth. It came from his breath. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let's read. 
And it's profitable for what? Doctrine. The scriptures will let you know about doctrine, the doctrine of God. Let's read. For what? Reproof. For what? Correction. For what? Instruction. And what? We use the scriptures to correct. We use the scriptures to reprove or to rebuke. We use the scriptures because it came from God. And it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. What is the purpose of it? Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. I wonder why you said thoroughly. It's throughly furnished unto what? All good works. What can make you perfect? What can make you perfect? What can prepare you unto every good work? The scriptures. Can we say amen? The scriptures is also the word of who? The word of God. And that's all the time we have tonight. God bless you. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Um, will we cover this subject, any other subject? Any questions? We only got halfway through the first page. As a matter of fact, the first paragraph. <laughs> no questions? All right, well... Oh, I had a question I didn't want to ask it. You better ask your question. All right. God bless you. All right, let's take our offering tonight and prepare to be dismissed. All right. I want to thank you for your attention tonight. I hope something was said that you can take with you. I'm always saying something controversial, am I? I'm <laughs>